What is up, Substance? Make some noise wherever you are at. You guys are looking good in the house. Welcome, everybody, to First Wednesday. I'm Pastor Peter Haas, and of course, I'm excited. We're going to take communion tonight, and we're going to, we're, and I love First Wednesdays because it, it kind of feels a little more like a leadership night. Uh, all of our hardcores from all of our campuses coming together, and you know, like a lot of our small group leaders in one room, but I, I, I have a deeper message for you tonight that I think you're going to, it's going to turn on some fun light bulbs, so to speak, in your heart. Um, you know, I, I, uh, it's actually on communion, but if I could, before we dive into that, if I could just share a, a couple leadership updates with you and, and a few prayer requests. Normally, I wouldn't share this on like a Sunday, but because you guys are the hardcores, you know, come on, I'll give you the inside scoop, right? But I, I just, you know, uh, for starters, let me just, let me just give a shout out to all the volunteers that have been making our At The Movie series such a big success. Thank you guys for serving, like for real, like uh, you guys, wow, you really invited your friends, like, like, wow, like, get this, we had over 450 or 445 first timers get the movie tickets alone, okay, and we're only talking about the ones that actually came and got them, like, I, and so many salvations the past few weeks. I mean, just even, you know, all, praying over the prayer cards has been so humbling. And, and, and uh, West Side, of course, is blowing up numerically. I don't know what the Lord is doing over there, but uh, a lot of people come in. And, uh, and which, by the way, let me just say this, okay? Uh, I really do believe that, that West, like, West Side is going to continue to multiply, and we just need more leaders there, actually. That's kind of, I mean, I, right now, numerically, it's, it's better than it's ever been, but we just need more leaders to help just, you know, hold the foyer down. Come on, you know who you are. Small group leaders, all of that, okay? Besides, so if you're out there and you're, we need, just, if you're out there and you don't, you don't care which campus really you're willing to drive the extra three minutes or whatever, um, just even if you just gave us six months there, I think it, it's really going to have a huge impact. Just six months, just until this fall. Um, we know Westside is going to double, but we just need leaders. And so, again, just let the Lord speak to you about it tonight. I, I will say, though, through our At The Movie series, despite how fun it is, if I could just confess this real fast, I kind of overdid it when I was like prepping for it. Can I just be honest with you? Uh, like the last three weeks uh, of the At The Movie series, I actually did most of the video editing. Uh, I literally was sitting in front of the computer a lot. And I just, part of it was, and I can do video editing, right? But I, I just, you know, really, I just wanted it to be amazing for our visitors and your, your friends, right, on Easter. But uh, of course, I forgot how hard video editing was on the eyes. And of course, right after I finished last week's documentary, the Easter one, uh, I finished it a couple weeks ago. But uh, I, I had such, like, terrible eye strain that I could barely even move my left eye. I mean, it literally was awful. Like I, it froze in my head. Like I couldn't turn it. And uh, I kept running into things and uh, the eye strain was so bad. I mean, literally, okay, like, I, and I know, I know, I know some of it was also spiritual warfare, but uh, after a nine-day headache, I, I, you guys, I was losing my mind. I had to go in for like an emergency eye appointment. And uh, guess what? It turns out I'm getting older. <laughs> right? It, it was, I know, right? It was like literally on the diagnosis, you're not a spring chicken anymore, you know? Like, and I was like, what? You know, and so the doctor told me that I need an entirely new collection of glasses. And so I had to go shopping, you know what I'm saying? It was the doctor's orders, okay? I had to. The, my wife was like, are you sure? And I'm like, baby, daddy's got to see. So, uh, uh, just so you know, you will see a lot of new frames in the coming weeks. I'm just saying. And uh, I, I, like for real though, you guys, it was awful. I'm not kidding. It was seriously awful. I'm like, oh Lord, I want to just pray for anybody that has eye issues. But I, I, all jokes aside, I do believe there are some spiritual warfare components to this. And I, 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 like, you have to understand, like, I, I didn't realize how many things I used my eyes for until uh, the last couple of weeks. And uh, Carolyn and I are writing a book on miracles right now. 
And uh, the book, in case you're wondering what the book that we're doing is, we're cataloging some of the craziest miracles we've seen over the, over, uh, really over the last couple decades. And I'm telling you, it's going to be the best book we've ever written, I'm telling you. But I also know that the devil does not want it to come out. And I, I just, I think about even the opportunities we're getting. Carolyn is going to be speaking um, at a pastor's conference in Dublin coming up. And then she's literally going to be speaking at a giant women's conference in a huge arena in Liverpool, England. Like people from all over Europe are coming to this. And I, I say that to say, it is fun, isn't it? But I, I say all that to say, I, I'm just trying to recruit more prayer, okay? We need prayer. And uh, I, it's humbling to watch the Lord accelerate things around here. And yet, I'm also uh, more aware of my frailness than ever before. And so uh, we're also moving our second daughter home from college. She's graduating. It's going to be so fun to have True back home too. But I, I just, it's a, it's a big, it's a big uh, couple months for us. And so be praying for us. Would you guys do that? Could you just commit to doing that for us and for your staff, for your campus pastors and your small group leaders? Because... Lord knows, I really do believe the Lord is up to something great here at Substance. And don't, don't stop inviting people in the coming weeks, okay? Our final week at the movies is going to be so amazing. And then after that, you guys, oh my gosh, Bob Hoskins is going to be in the house. And if you don't know who Bob Hoskins is, he's like a living legend. Like, literally, I mean, like, he's done everything. I mean, he started churches on, like, five continents, right? I mean, he's had five assassination attempts. He's like, he, like, helped launch YWAM. And that was, like, you know, way back in the day. Like, he, he, I mean, he's 87 years old, and he's still changing the world. He's coming to preach in person. And, and I, I just, like, you guys have to understand, every time, like, he's the one who gave me the idea to do Substance Studios. He's the one who kind of, like, arrested me and, and uh, pulled me aside. And, and his son, Rob, actually, Rob Hoskins is on the board for the TV show of The Chosen, um, making sure it stays doctrinally pure and uh, financially free, okay? So, like, just, uh, like you have to understand, uh, the Hoskins family is, like, legend. Like, two billion Bibles they've given away. Uh, in just, you know, like, I mean, it's really, a, it's mind-blowing. It's actually been really fun because Carolyn serves on the board of One Hope, the organization they started. And, and so just getting some of the behind-the-scenes views on everything happening with the, tr with, uh, the TV show The Chosen has just been so fun. Uh, and I can say, you guys, it's truly, 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 truly in good hands. Uh, in fact, right now, many of you guys know that season four of The Chosen is in theaters only. Uh, so you have to pay to go see it. I'm thrilled tonight, you guys. This is kind of a fun announcement, actually. Substance acquired a special license to show it. And guess what? The next two Wednesdays, we're going to be debuting season four right here for free. Right here. Okay, so... I'm just saying, this is first Wednesday, we're going to have second Wednesday, then we're going to have third Wednesday, okay, because like this coming Wednesday, we're going to do uh, episodes one and two, then the next Wednesday, episodes three and four, and you guys, come on, the theater would cost you like $30, and they don't even give you potty breaks. But at Substance, we're going to have free childcare, free popcorn, free soda, free potty breaks. You, I mean, we're going to give it all, right? I mean, all I ask, all I ask from you guys, all I ask is that you would invite your friends and, and maybe that some of you, a couple of you would just clean up afterwards because all y'all are pegs, man. I'm just saying. I love you, but after 4,100 boxes of popcorn in the last couple of weeks, I'm just saying. Woo, it, you know, cleaning. Uh, but, okay, it, so, but if you're here and you're like, oh my gosh, I, I want to catch up before I watch season four, that's right. You got one week to binge watch three seasons. You can do it. If you can do it for these other smutty TV shows, come on, just binge watch Jesus. It's worth it. You will cry tears of joy. Actually, we've been doing that, and it's been awesome every night. I just... Oh, and then Baptism Sunday after that, it's just insane. You guys, this month is crazy. <laughs> so I just literally felt like, you know what, in light of everything God is doing, I thought, let's just take communion. Let's covenant with our God again. Let's remember his grace. Let's remember his power. And, 
And uh, I, I, just, I just thought it would be powerful for us as a, as a church to do that together tonight. And if you're, if you're newer to this whole God thing and you don't really know what this is all about, well, basically Jesus created a ritual that his disciples could do and that we are supposed to do. It's like a sacrament is something that we are supposed to continue to do. It started out as a meal. And of course, you can still do it as a meal. Uh, but over the centuries, it kind of evolved into a much simpler ritual. And, and basically, Basically, when we take communion, we have the bread and the wine, it's symbolic, okay? God wants to have a relationship with us, and when we take that, that communion meal, it's us signing a contract with God or reaffirming the contract we've already done, okay? So in ancient times, okay, this is kind of the way I describe it, okay? In ancient times, if you wanted to sign a lifelong contract with someone that was really intense, a lot of times there was a certain type of covenant contract called a blood covenant, okay? Now, you would not enter into a blood covenant with just anyone because a blood covenant was extra intense. It's called a blood covenant because something had to die. You had to sacrifice something. And there was a whole ritual that went along with it. But uh, really, you, the reason why it was an intense kind of covenant is because when you entered into a blood covenant with somebody, everything you have becomes the possession of the person you enter into the covenant with, okay? So all of your money becomes theirs, also all of your debt. Okay, so you wouldn't want to just enter into a covenant with somebody that has a lot of debt because everything you have becomes theirs. All, and same thing with your, your, your name, your reputation, your legal authority. It became the, the, the ownership, combined ownership with the person you were entering in your covenant with. Okay, so you would never, never, never enter into a blood covenant haphazardly. And, and, but really, the reason why I brought that up is because that's what communion is. It's actually a blood covenant. Everything you have becomes the possession of God. Your time, your money, your assets, your vocation, all of it is the Lord's. And you can't say, God, I'm going to enter into this contract with you, but I still want to work where I want to work, live where I want to live, do what I want to do. You know what I'm saying? You can't say that anymore. You are now the possession of God, okay? And, uh, and so that's why the Apostle Paul said, if you take communion and you don't mean it, you actually create a, you bring a curse on yourself, which is kind of intense, right? He, he called it taking communion in an unworthy manner, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven. And don't get me wrong, when, when, like, he's not saying that, that you make God angry when you do it. It's, it's more along the lines of the curse is that you'll live with the false impression that you're blessed when you're not. Okay, which is actually really dangerous, okay? It's like saying, I'm going to drive without a seatbelt at 90 miles an hour and think that God's going to protect me. Actually, you're deceived, okay? So a communion, although it does cost you everything, trust me, you get the better end of the deal. Because the Bible says that the, all the fullness of the deity comes to live in you. Colossians 2. I mean, how cool is that, okay? And so now, with that said, though, let me, I'm going to dive into this whole, where does communion come from? How many of you guys have heard of the Last Supper? Just raise your hand. Just, it's, a, it's the name of a story. It's actually the place where Jesus started this sacrament. It was a Passover meal with the disciples. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit the version of it out of John 16 because it's kind of interesting. Uh, at the Last Supper, Jesus was trying to tell his disciples that he was going to die. He was going to tell, he was, he was giving them hints that I'm also going to resurrect. I'm going to ascend into heaven. So it's not all bad news, but they were so confused because they're like, huh? Like, wait, wait a second. The Messiah is here. So therefore it's the end of the world and you're just going to take over and everything's going to be awesome, right? I mean, but Jesus was like, no, like, no, you guys don't get it yet. There's actually, there's actually two comings of the Messiah and this is just the first one. And, and, and I'm actually going to go to heaven for a bit and then I'm going to come back and they're not getting any of it. Okay. Cause in their minds, they, they're just thinking, they're thinking incorrectly, incomplete about all this. Right. And so it's, it finally says, says in John 16, 17, okay, so Jesus is talking, and it says, some of his disciples said to one another, what does he mean by saying, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me, and because I am going to the Father, it was like, it's like they kept asking, what does he mean by a little while soon, what does soon mean in a little while, we don't understand what he's saying. 
If you've ever felt lost reading the words of Jesus, don't worry, the disciples did too. And they lived with him, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, that was like the most encouraging thing. Some of you are gonna be like, that's all I needed to hear tonight. <laughs> it's okay to be confused, okay? I, just being honest, I think, I think that's kind of funny that they admit it and that John puts all those details in. And, and even funnier, get this, Jesus knew he was hard to understand and he admits it. Check this out, okay, just a couple verses later, Jesus actually admitted in John 16, 25, okay, I love this. He actually finally like confesses to them, I know it's been rough, and he goes like this, though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will speak plainly. I will tell you plainly, about my father, okay? And you could just imagine the disciples, like in verse 29, it act, it's a couple verses down, it, you know, they were basically like, thank you for saying that. <laughs> like the last three years, I just thought I was stupid. You know what I'm saying? I mean, just how long have you been doing this to us? You know what I'm saying? Like, because God, I, <laughs> I thought I was the worst disciple on earth, right? And then there was that, probably that one disciple that pretend to, pretended to understand everything. Mmm, so good. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know that, there's always that guy, right? And, and I, I, you know what I mean? Like I, I had, so uh, a few years back, I had a mentor, pastor friend of mine. He was teaching a, a small group of us pastors and he used like this really big word and he quoted a book as if we like obviously knew it. You know what I'm saying? And of course, for some reason, I just pretended to understand and I'm nodding like, mm. you know, I just didn't want to look stupid. Have you ever done that? Have you ever found yourself doing that? I, I, and then finally, my friend just raises his hand. He goes, uh, like, what does that word mean? Also, I don't, I've never read that book. Have all y'all read that book? You know, like, and he's looking around and I'm like, but, but in my heart, I was like, thank God he asked. You know what I'm saying? Because I was completely lost, but yet completely committed to pretending I'm not. Okay, so I, I just, I bring all this up because Jesus did the exact same thing 10 chapters earlier in John 6, okay? He was talking about communion, and he was actually giving a similar teaching 10 chapters earlier in John, but he's dropping hints about his death, dropping hints about his resurrection, giving a communion teaching, and yet it's also making zero sense to anybody. And so I'm going to give you the context, okay? So in John 6, Jesus, this is, remember the story where he just multiplied the five loaves of bread and the two fish to the 5,000. He fed the 5,000, did this crazy miracle, and of course, you know, the crowds, they were freaking out like, wow, this is so amazing. This miracle reminds me of the miracle of manna from the Old Testament with Moses where, you know, bread from heaven, and then that reminded them of this messianic prophecy, okay? And I want to share this with you real quick, okay, because when Jesus multiplied the loaves and the fish for the 5,000, immediately you'll start to see the narrative is constantly talking about Moses. And, and, and if you've ever read it in context, you're like, why is everybody so obsessed about Moses? It's because everybody saw the bread multiply and they immediately thought of manna. And the moment they thought of manna, they thought of Moses. And the moment they thought of Moses, they thought of the messianic prophecies, Moses said something pretty crazy in Deuteronomy 18, right before they entered the promised land. He said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. Like who? Moses. So they're looking for a Moses. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers. You must listen to him. Now, all throughout the Old Testament, they're looking for the new Moses, they're, but they don't, they're not finding it, okay? So, so when Jesus all of a sudden comes along and he multiplies the bread, everyone started freaking out thinking he is the one that Moses foretold. This is a messianic prophecy. They, people started freaking out and... Um, 
And, and what was crazy is, is ap- so after he did this, you know, the Jewish people were looking for signs and wonders after this, okay? And if you're wondering what a sign is versus a wonder, both are miracles. Sometimes you use it interchangeably, but a sign is a miracle that points to a, pro- a prophetic fulfillment, okay? So, so they're looking for signs of what Moses talked about, and, and they thought, this is it. I mean, the bread. This is the, this is the sign that he is the one Moses talked about. And, and so, you know, as they're freaking out, right, Jesus knew in his mind. Now, was Jesus the fulfillment to that? Yes. Jesus knew technically that's true. I am the one, but your expectations about me are way off because you don't understand the Messiah comes twice. Okay, now just hold that in your heart because, you know, Jesus knows, like, this is what the thought process going on in the mind of the people when he fed the 5,000. They're they're thinking, oh my gosh, you know what? He is the one, and you know what that means? Just like Moses delivered us from Pharaoh, from the Egyptians, Jesus is going to deliver us from the Romans. Let's get ready. And they were going to force him to be king right in that passage, okay? A lot of people miss that, that they they basically were going to try to take the Moses prophecy and make it fulfilled. And so it actually says in John 6, 15, after the 5,000, the crowds were going to make Jesus by force, okay? As if you could do that, right? As if that's a great idea, right? And and Jesus was thinking, yeah, you know what? My second coming is going to be like that, okay? Yeah, because they're thinking, you know, Moses and the plagues, remember that? all the plagues, Jesus was like, actually, you got that right, but that's my second coming, okay? It's going to be like that for my second coming, but your timing is 100% off, and therefore, you do not understand what I'm doing, okay? Suddenly, Jesus, so Jesus is in the situation after the 5,000 where he has to simmer everyone the heck down because they just wanted to start a military Revival, okay? You get the idea. So the, the feeding of the 5,000 almost turned into a military revolt, and Jesus had to actually stop it. And so what did he do? He, he was going to try to reframe the moment. He actually snuck away. He had his disciples split up, cross the lake, and, and the people that had boats followed the disciples, okay? And then when, remember when Jesus walked on the water, which happened right after this? He crossed the Sea of Galilee. A lot of people don't realize that he didn't just walk on the water to be like, what's up, guys? You know what I'm saying? Like, he wasn't just doing it to, like, show off. Uh, This was his way of tricking the crowds, okay? Because remember, he snuck into the mountains because they're going to start a military revolt. He has to simmer them down. So he goes, it was actually misdirection, okay? He goes off into the mountains in the middle, like at the nighttime, and then sneaks back to the lake, walks straight across the lake, okay? So this was actually him doubling back, doing supernatural misdirection. And by the way, uh, just for those of you who are going to be binge-watching The Chosen, uh, that episode when he walks on water, coolest episode ever. I mean, literally, one of the coolest things I've ever seen, okay? You're going to love it. Another quick side note. Now, here's, this is actually not a side note. This is really important. Okay, when when Jesus fed the 5,000 with supernatural bread, he did something really, 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 really weird. And here's a detail I've never heard anyone preach on before, but I think it's important. Okay, Jesus said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. Okay, remember, we're talking about 5,000 people plus women and children that's a lot of stuff, right? Okay, they, they're thinking, Jesus, we're so tired. Why don't we just let it go? You know what I'm saying? Like, Jesus, is this like, is this Jesus being like ultra frugal? Is this Jesus being thrifty? Like, I want you to pack it up and take it with us. You know what I'm saying? What are you going to do with it, Jesus, right? Okay, so they gathered them and they filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. Now, okay, now in the, the Bible is so cool, you guys. I mean, like every detail matters. Every word here, it matters, okay? It's almost as if, it's almost as if God was trying to do poetic commentary on what just happened, okay? So he, this was not Jesus being frugal. This was Jesus making a prophetic statement about what just went down to his disciples. Because remember, there, how many tribes of Israel were there? 
12, okay? And how many baskets were left over? 12, okay? And, and so just th- that symbolism is not by mistake, okay? Whenever you see a 10 or a 12 or a 7 or a 3, you know there's something extra divine on it, okay? Now, bread, what did that mean in, in, in the Bible, symbol, uh, the symbolism? It, it was God's word, okay? Because Jesus said, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He actually made that statement when he was being tempted. He was actually reenacting the, the Exodus story, the will wilderness journey, and he was fulfilling, he was doing what the Israelites did not do well, and that was live on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Okay, so it was a statement, and he was quoting Deuteronomy, Moses, when he said that, okay? So just keep this in mind. So, so basically, what the, the, the reason why there were 12, and the reason why Jesus actually made all of his disciples pick it up is because, you know, the Israelites died in the wilderness in the days of Moses because they did not live on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And, and the same, it was actually the very reason why the Jews were misunderstanding the comings of Christ, that they didn't understand that there were two comings of the Messiah because they were not living on every word that proceeded from the prophets over the century. They weren't, they basically, they were ingesting the bread, the prophecies that made them feel good, yet they were tossing the scraps on the ground that did not satisfy their agenda. Are you hearing me? It was a prophetic statement. He was saying, oh, oh, you're going to eat the bread until you're full. But then, oh, my tummy hurts. I'm not sure. I'm, I don't want to eat anymore, Jesus. And you're just going to throw it on the ground. And Jesus was basically saying, oh, no, 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 no. Every bread, every scrap, every prophetic Bible promise in the Old Testament is absolutely important. And you're going to eat all of it. Okay? Actually, what he was, the real mistake here, like, I just let me say it this way, okay? He was, it was not like, oh, look at the abundance of all the extra bread. That was not what the point of the 12 baskets. It was like, it was actually the point of, the point of it was, oh, look at how much the people did not ingest. It's what Jesus wanted his disciples to see. Every scrap matters. He wanted, he was really making his disciples collect it because he was essentially saying, you guys, do not choose the parts of God's word that are just fun for you and then throw away the other things because that is exactly why they think we're here to lead a military revolt when in reality they're missing the whole point. They're only ingesting the stuff that makes them feel comfortable, the stuff that they want, and then they're throwing away the rest. And then, Get, so really, he was, he was, Jesus was basically saying the covenant, the covenant, he talks about communion, bread, right? The covenant goes both ways. God gets to make some inconvenient demands of us, and the very next teaching is on the subject of what? Bread and communion, and then all of a sudden, it gets more profound, okay? So this is the setup, okay? <laughs> it's so fun. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so then get this. Jesus walks on the water. He shakes half the crowd, does the little misdirection. They go to Capernaum together. Once again, the crowd start dogging him with these half-applied prophecies of Moses. And then they were like, well, you know, you gave us bread like Moses, Jesus, right? Now give us rules like Moses, right? I mean, because Moses had a lot of, he had the Ten Commandments, and then he had the 613, you know, all the, uh, you know. And then we'll have a revival, Jesus. That's kind of what they were forcing him to do in Capernaum. And and, uh, they had this very specific idea about how this whole Messiah thing was supposed to look. And they were pushing that agenda on Jesus. And so Jesus was like, all right, I'm done. Time to break that bubble. I'm going to give you all a hard teaching. You say you want bread. You say you want manna. You say you want, oh, signs and wonders. You say you want a Moses Messiah. And you want me to bring a covenant like he did. Well, let me tell you how this covenant looks. This is what it's going to look like. And then he purposely describes communion in probably the most graphic and offensive way you possibly could, okay? I mean, it was almost like I'm going to purposely do a teaching that's going to make you guys feel very, very very uncomfortable, and this is what he says. He starts out by saying, Luke 6, 48, I am the bread of life. 
Okay, now if I, as your pastor, just showed up and said, I am your salami sandwich, okay, it's, it's weird. It would be weird. You're like, what does he mean by that? That was a little creepy. You know what I'm saying? Like, you have to understand, it was, it was strange, okay? So I know that these are the words of Jesus, but you have to just imagine you're hearing it for the first time, okay? I am the bread of life. And then we'll skip down to verse 54, okay? He basically is like, stop looking for miracles, start looking for me. Stop looking for miracles, start looking for me. And then he says this, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. What just happened here? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I just invited my neighbor and now, <laughs> you know, and then pastor does that message. You know, people started freaking out. I mean, this guy's out of his mind. Is this cannibalism? You know what I mean? And then, and then I love this, John 666. John 6, verse 66, okay? Uh, like it, <laughs> sorry, here, there's a missing verse in here. Okay, so. This is, this is what he says, from this, John 6, 6, 6, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Okay, so it was the big exodus. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. So basically, it worked. Whatever Jesus' plan was to, you know, freak people out, it worked. He, did, he gave that perfect wet blanket message. It was fully true, but he knew, oh, the fake fans are not going to be able to get it, right? Because they're not, they're not ingesting all of the bread of the Old Testament prophecies. And so, in fact, so many left, though, that all of a sudden, this is where we see a little self-doubt in Jesus. This is kind of reassuring for me when I feel like I, there's those weeks where I go home from church and I'm like, man, we're so screwed up, this whole church. You know, like, I I know some of you are like, what, you ever say that? Yeah, I do. Uh, But... (laughs) But, but Jesus felt that too, okay? So now, now he's actually worried that the 12 are going to quit, okay? So this was such a hard message. So many people stopped following Jesus that it got to the point where even the 12, there was clearly some murmuring going on uh, because the message was tough enough that even, you know, even the 12 were like, you know, does Jesus need a sabbatical? You know what I'm saying? Like, man, we should have gotten a guest preacher for that Sunday. You know what I'm saying? And so... <laughs> And so in verse, this is technically 67, okay? So John 6, verse 67, it says, he he says, you don't want to leave me too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. I mean, think about this. Like, you don't want to leave me too. I mean, I just chose you, and I thought this was going pretty good. You saw me walk on the water, which was pretty cool, right? That freaked you out. But, you know... You don't want to leave me too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Now, something tells me that's not the most reassuring answer, right? Where where else should we go? You know what I'm saying? (laughs) If if, if your wife asks you, do you think I'm fat? Don't say, well, I don't have anybody else to go to. Okay, don't say that. (laughs) That's not what she wants to hear. Okay? So... Peter gives the worst answer ever, the least reassuring answer. Well, to whom else, where else do we have to go? Okay, and and then he saves himself, you know. Peter always kind of comes around, saves himself, and this is what he said. He said, you have the words of eternal life. We believe. He pledged it, his heart to Jesus on behalf of all the disciples, verse 69. I, I think, you know, it's, it, it's fun for me to even see little passages like this in Scripture. I, I think about um, over the years as I've, as I've pastored this church, there's the fun years and then there's the not-so-fun years, right? The fun years are like, you know, the year after we move into a new building. It's just fun, right? Because it feels like we're growing and then all of a sudden, all those ministries that we haven't been able to green light, we can suddenly green light because we finally have space. We finally have space to launch that ministry or that ministry, right? I mean, there's just so many ministries that we have the leaders for, but we just don't have the square footage for. And, and, and so those are the fun years, but then there's the non fun years. Come on, I think some of you have been, those, there's a few hardcores in the room tonight. You're like, I remember a non-fun year. Hopefully, uh, you know, uh, anyway, I, I, 
I'm like, edit, edit your words, Peter. Um, I, I do, I remember one non-fun year where I had to, <laughs> I had to fire an employee, but for legal reasons, I couldn't share why, okay? According to the law, I cannot share why. Um, and then to make matters worse, the staff that, that got fired uh, started giving a totally different reason to all of his friends and uh, small group friends. And so I kept getting this never-ending supply of phone calls. How could you be so mean? And in my mind, I'm like, you have no idea what I want to do. You know, like I, I just, but I couldn't share anything. I couldn't even defend myself. I, I just, all I could say was, hey, you're going to have to trust me. You're going to have to trust me. And some people were like, I, I'm done. And uh, again, legally, I couldn't say anything. But there, and there's nothing more dehumanizing and humiliating than when you feel misunderstood, when people think they know what you're thinking and they don't. And yet you don't even, even if I could have told them, I don't even know if I would have had the time to individually go around to all these people, right? And so I'm just feeling so humiliated. It was just, it was awful. And, but, but even more humiliating is when, when there's collateral damage, right? I, I, I kept hearing about, oh, yeah, that family left now because because of what you did. And I'm like, what do you mean? You don't even know what I did. Like, it wasn't even me. You know, like, I was just like, it was like me in the foyer every week, right? And then, and, and, um, and you know, I, I, I say that because I think all leaders are going to go through moments of feeling misunderstood. And, and parents too, if you're a parent, sometimes you're going to have to make decisions that your kids just can't understand or won't understand. And, and, but how many of you guys know that time always reveals the truth? Okay? And even if it doesn't reveal the full truth, it at least reveals your character, your consistency, right? And, and I, I'll never forget there were a lot of families that walked away from substance in that season just because of the confusion. But I think the saddest thing for me is that right after a lot of these families left, God started miraculously birthing the very ministries in our church that they would have loved the most. I kept thinking, like, it was like week after week, like, oh, that one family, they would have loved being here for this because, man, this is what they were praying for for years. And they left right before we were able to launch it. And I just, I would, I would think about those people and, in, in, in a, it's, it's hard to not think about those people. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I don't care about the six new families coming. I care about the one that just left, you know, and, and it wasn't on the best terms. And I, I just, you know, but I, I think, you know, there's, there's grieving moments. I remember asking God, why did this happen? But I, I share all of that because I, I, you know, Jesus w had to make hard decisions. He knew that they were misinterpreting the movement. He had to slow it down and reframe it. And I say that because there's a lesson there. Choosing right does not always mean feeling right. And I wish I understood that early. I, early, I, early on, I thought if I just lead perfectly, it's always going to feel good and everybody's going to feel good. You're going to feel good. I'm going to feel good. I'm going to be the most amazing parent. My kids will always feel like, well, oh, Dad, you're the best. You know what I'm saying? Like, and it's just going to be beautiful. But listen, it doesn't work that way. Choosing right does not always mean feeling right. And I, I just have this sense here tonight that somebody here needs, you need to know that. You're making courageous decisions at your job or at your workplace or in your family or, or, or amidst your friends and, and you're gonna be misunderstood and, and you're trying to avoid it. And I just, listen, when you choose to lead, you will be misunderstood from time to time. But the same thing is true when you sign a covenant with God, okay? All Christians, all Christians will be misunderstood at some point by following Christ. True followership will require that of you. And we don't just eat the bread and the wine, the eat the bread that we want and spit out the stuff that doesn't, you know, make us, you know, uncomfortable. Going back to the feeding of the 5,000, I, I actually think that there was not supposed to be any bread left over. That was actually what God intended. The leftover bread was not meant to be a, a, a symbol of surplus, but it was actually a symbol of disobedience, okay? I don't want to ingest that bread. I, I don't want to obey that command of Scripture because that makes me feel uncomfortable, and I'm full enough. You know what I mean? I don't want to lead a small group. My life is full enough. I don't want to tithe. I don't want to launch a new campus, go to odd service times. I don't want to fast and do these other awkward disciplines. I'm full enough. I just want to take, but, but I want those, this part of Christianity, this little part of the bread. I want this part of church, but I want to throw the scraps out. You know what I'm saying? Here's the truth. Following Christ will have stretching moments, stretching moments. 
you got to eat, hey, you took it, you got to eat the whole thing, you know, like, anybody ever use that one on your kids before? Again, it's going to cause discomfort, stretching when you start eating what the Lord is giving you. But how many of you know, in the end, it's worth it, right? I I remember the families that left in that season, um, there were two that that came back, and it was kind of validating because I remember one family came back, it was about six years later, and uh, the one family came up to me, and they're like, Pastor, I am so sorry. I wrote you that really mean email. I had no idea what I was saying. I, I had no idea what had actually happened. I figured, I put you know, two plus two together later on. I, and they were like, I never should have left. Actually, the consequences on my family were, were pretty heavy. My, my kids hate church now, and I don't know if I can get them to come back with me. But, and, and it was sad, but I was like, bro, I've, I've got you. Let's go win your kids, right? And, and then another came back eight years later after their family had completely fallen apart. And, and they were very honest with me. They were like, hey, you know what? I still don't know what happened back then, but, you know, I will say this about you, Peter. You and Carolyn have been the most consistent pastors in my life, and, uh, you know, God just made it very clear that his hand is on you and the church, and I should just come back and be under that blessing, and I was like, well, I'm glad you figured it out, you know what I'm saying? No, I, I, you know what I mean? In moments like that, I didn't even, I didn't even feel good about it. I actually just felt like, oh, that's so tragic, you know? I wish you could have been there all along, but I, I realized that, hey, listen, th- this, is, this is the roller coaster of the call that God has for us. I think that's why I've been such a big fan of The Chosen, because you see the drama. It gives you like, you know, just to see the disciples fighting, you're like, oh, my staff is okay. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> I love you guys. No, we, we are a family. You know what I'm saying? Like, we are a family, but families fight too, right? And so in the midst of this heavy teaching, though, okay, this is the best part. In the midst of this heavy teaching, and Jesus is, you know, like, are you going to leave me? He says the craziest thing, and in my opinion, this is, this is one of the most profound verses in the entire New Testament. And, uh, and again, the crowds thought, if you're a prophet of Moses... Moses gave us 613 commands, right? I mean, the entire Jewish identity was all about enforcing these 613 commands on the people, okay? That's really what the Pharisees were doing, okay? It was legalism. And the reason they wanted to overthrow the Romans is because the Romans wouldn't allow them to force these 613 commands on everybody. Everybody, the whole world should be getting circumcised and the whole world should be, you know, doing, not picking up mats on the Sabbath. The whole world should just, you know, our worldview. We just want to take it and conquer the world with these rules. And, and so really, if you think about it, so in, in, John, in John 6, 28, they ask Jesus a very specific question and they say this, okay? Then they ask Jesus, what must we do to do the works God requires, okay? And, and, and really what they're asking for is, they're like, Jesus, give us a legislative agenda that we can use and rally around and then conquer the world and force it upon people with, okay? So really what they're asking for, because Moses, he brought the law, and so you're like Moses, so bring us more law. Like, they wanted legalism. They wanted legalism, which is why they wanted a military solution, Okay, are you getting this? Because that's what military does. And you can control and you can force laws. And so you get the idea. So give us the laws, right? They, they basically want a stump speech from a politician. Uh, they want them to be like, well, I'm going to take over. And the Romans, we're going to take over this political law. And then we're going to force this. We're going to stick it to the Romans here. And they, they want to be like, yeah, let's do it. Right, okay, so this is what they're expecting, okay? They wanted some sort of self-righteous agenda that they could conquer the world with in the name of these laws, right? And so the key word here is works, okay? Say it, works. <laughs> there it is. You're like, it disappeared. I don't know what to say. Okay, works. Okay. Plural, okay? What was Jesus' response to this question? He answered this. He says, Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Right here. I think 
on the surface, it sounds kind of simple, but actually it's probably one of the most profound verses in the entire New Testament because everyone who heard him say this, their jaws had just dropped, okay? They're like, Jesus, that is not a very long list. I mean, come on, Moses gave us all those commandments. Where's all the extra stuff? Jesus, that is not a rousing stump speech. Come on, you're supposed to be the Messiah. This is supposed to get us all like, like to believe one thing, like, like that's so understated, okay? I mean, and how many of you know Jesus could have said a million things, right? I mean, he could have, there's a, I mean, there were a million bad things the Romans were doing that he could have spoken about. I mean, genuinely, he could have given a very, very long political speech against the Romans. Heck, there were an equally number of bad things that the Jewish leaders were doing too. I mean, he also could have endlessly ranted about just the people in the room, right? All y'all need to stop doing this and you need to start doing that. Oh, you want some law? Okay, you know what? Heck, Jesus could have even read some of their minds and just started calling them out. You, you have a lust problem. You, you need to like chill out. Like you, you need to shut up and start serving your spouse. You one word, snack cakes. <laughs> it's a compound word. You know what I'm saying? Like, and the rest of all y'all, I know what you did last summer. You know what I'm saying? Then he could have said, and by the way, you all have terrible theology. You think angels are naked babies with wings? Do you realize how offended they are by that? <laughs> I mean, think about it. He could have lit them up for hours. He could have lit them up and just said, Oh my gosh, you guys are missing it. And yet, did he do that? No. That's because, you know, what did he say? It's almost irritatingly simple. And it, to this day, makes legalistic people angry. To this day, makes people that have the wrong agenda angry, right? Because he really says this, believe, believe like have faith in the one God is sending, right? Faith results in faithfulness. Why? Why did he say, really believe in the one he sent, right? Like I figured it out, okay? So I was meditating on this for like probably like a couple of years, okay? I just could not get this out of my mind. I couldn't get it out of my heart. And finally, I was, I was actually memorizing Galatians 5.22, the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Do you remember that passage? It's like... Um, um, Oh, no, I have to remember it. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is, oh, there we go. Okay. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Is that right? Okay, okay, okay. My wife is like, keep going, Peter. No, uh, I, no, okay. I was actually studying it in Greek, okay? So go easy on me. And what was interesting about each one of these words in Greek is I finally got to uh, the, the, the word for faithfulness, okay? And it's a Greek word called pistis, which uh, that'll, it's easy to remember, right? But I, I just, okay, now it's kind of a tricky word to translate into English because, you know, like uh, in English, the word faithfulness is, it means reliability, right? If you were to say someone is faithful, that means they're reliable. They're, they show up consistently. But the Greek word here actually, it, it carries the sense of optimism. It's a person who is optimistic about the future, okay? And so one lexicon actually defines that Greek word is, as this. Pistis means to be full of faith and therefore consistent in character full of faith and therefore consistent in character. And so maybe instead of faithfulness, it might be a little more accurate to say faith-filledness that results in faithfulness. Does that make sense? Yep. Being so full of faith that faithfulness just flows. You are so full of belief, so trusting of God that faithfulness and consistency naturally flows out of you. You don't strive to be faithful. You strive to be faith-filled, and faithfulness naturally flows. Okay, that's really kind of a, a better way to define it. Okay, so let me give you one last example. Years ago, I wanted to be more faithful in prayer, and yet I couldn't because it was so boring. <laughs> and I have like ADHD. I need to 
pace, you know what I'm saying? I need to like just, you know, orbit while I pray. And then those prayer people that are like, really like, let's stand and hold hands. It's like, no, it's like a tiger in a cage. Don't do that. It's like, ah. And I remember like, why? I remember like going to the Lord. Why can't I pray? Why can't I pray? Why do I hate praying? I can't pray as long as so-and-so. They like, you know, they pray forever. And, and then I realized something. You know what? My problem is not prayer. And, and yeah, it is a little easier when I get to move around, okay? But actually, even when I get to move around, that's not my problem, okay? Uh, my problem is I don't think God is listening. I finally just like the thought occurred to me. I feel like I'm just kind of wasting my time. I don't think God actually hears what I'm saying, which isn't true. And so what I did was I started memorizing Bible verses on prayer. I knew that, well, prayer avails much. It means, you know, James 5, 16, if you do it, you, you work less because you're praying, okay? Work produced through faith, First Thessalonians says, or, or God sends out angels in response to every little single word we say. Guess what? If we actually believe that, that God would send out angels on new assignments for every little prayer that we pray, guess what? Praying would be easy. You would naturally want to do it all the time, okay? So the problem is not self-discipline, it's faith. Does that make sense? You don't actually believe in it, Therefore, you don't do it, okay? So, or let me just change the metaphor, okay? Let's say I struggle with, like, generosity, tithes or offerings or whatever, right? If I, if I really believed that Luke 6.38 were true, give and it will be given to you, a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap, okay? In other words, you're going to give and then, boom, you're going to be blessed in this overwhelming way. If you actually believed that, generosity would not even be a hard thing for you. You'd be like, oh, suckers, I'm going to give more. You know what I'm saying? Like, you'd be so into generosity, you wouldn't have to do it. It wouldn't be an obligation. It would be a celebration. It's kind of like, um, you know, like at the gas station, they have those little gas guns, right? Have you ever just like, just, you want to shoot them in the air, but you can't because it's, it's illegal? But... <laughs> You know, is that just me? Wouldn't that be awesome? I always wondered how, like, how much pressure goes through it, like how far it could make it. I guess we'll never know. But uh, for real, though, like for real, just stick with me, okay? For real, have you ever been to the gas station and then have you ever seen those people with the gas guns who, like, squirted into their mouths a lot of times they'll take like uh, alcohol wipes and wipe off the nozzle before they do it, you know? No, no, you have not seen that, okay? And there's a reason for that. Nobody does that, I hope. And why? Why do people not do that? Because we are full of faith that drinking gasoline would be a terrible experience. <laughs> and because of that faith, we don't do it. It's not like you go to the gas station and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm like so tempted. <laughs> you're not. Why? Because you're full of faith that would be bad, okay? Are you hearing me? You see, behavior follows belief with all behaviors, all behaviors. Your problem is not your behavior, it's your belief. Your problem is not your faithfulness, it's your faith. Your problem is not self-discipline, it's that you don't actually believe the thing God is calling you to do. And so your behavior naturally is in sync with that belief. And that's why a long time ago, church, I gave up on trying to be faithful to God, which sounds kind of scandalous when I say it out loud. But here's the truth, instead of focusing on being faithful to God, I focus on being full of faith, and guess what? Faithfulness naturally flows. It's amazing. I find the self-discipline to do all sorts of things that I would normally never naturally have the ability to do, but it flows directly from the Holy Spirit. And I think it, that's why if we could only do one thing, Jesus said, the work of God is this. You really want to focus on one thing? To what? Believe in the one he has sent. Well, if you're out there, 
And you're like, well, how do you get full of faith? You didn't even say that, Peter. What, what do you, how do you get full of faith? Well, it's actually quite simple. Faith comes by hearing the word of God, okay? And, and that reference right here is Romans 10, 17, okay? So we're a little bit off there, but Romans 10, 17. <laughs> faith comes by hearing the word of God, okay? And guess what, guess what one of the names of God is? Jesus the, Jesus is the living word of God. Whoa, wait a second. The work of God is this, to believe in the word of God, the living word, right? You're, you're hearing, see, every time you hear the Bible, it puts more faith into your heart. You don't even know it, but it happens. You may not even feel it, but it happens. And so that's why I always say you got to go to church. You got to go to small group. Expose yourself to places that give you more promises of Jesus, right? That's why Ephesians 5.19 says, you know, speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Just constantly speak truth to one another, right? Joshua 1.8, never let the book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on a day and night. Psalm 1, you know, if you, you just, again, constantly on your lips, and, and I, I promise you, church, Bible reading gets way more fun every single year that I do it. Honestly, it, I, I, like even last night, I could not even go to bed. It was like 1 a.m., and I could not go to bed until I finished memorizing like Daniel 7.13. I was just like so into it because it was just so awesome, you know. I was just so into it, and I, I'm, I'm telling you this because there's an addiction that God wants you to get. And, and, be, and I'm addicted because... These, this power and this stuff flows out of me, faithfulness, all these things, they flow out of me the more I get into it. And it's kind of like that study I shared at the, in week one of First Comes Love, if you remember this, okay? People who read the Bible for four or more days a week uh, have significant, are significantly less likely to struggle with pornography, extramarital affairs, alcoholism, gambling addictions. This is just the beginning of it, okay? They found that for some weird reason, there was a threshold, a tipping point. People that read their Bibles for three days or less would not have any of these benefits. But the moment you hit four or more, all of a sudden, bam, self-control. What in the world? Well, I mean, what? really, it's just evidence of what <laughs> Jesus said all along. Believe, believe. Living word. Get, faith comes by hearing the word. And the reason this mattered so much to Jesus at his first coming is because he knew. Again, I'll wrap it up with this. God's people, the Jews, were missing the faith that resulted in true faithfulness. They were substituting legalism for true, true kingdom living. He knew that, that, that the 613 laws of Moses had been turned into an obligation rather than a celebration. And if you would be honest, some of you, you grew up in churches where they took even the New Testament and turned it into an obligation. It's amazing what legalistic people can do. And, and he knew that, that, that the, the Jewish people in those days, they saw it as an action instead of a reaction. They were motivated by guilt instead of by grace. And ultimately, Christ knew, hey, listen, um, before the Messiah's second coming, before I return, guess what? The gospel needs to go to the Gentiles, also known as the Romans, which Jesus is thinking, I'm not trying to defeat them, I'm trying to win them. And if you guys knew what I was doing, you would stop talking like this. Stop it. Win the people that you're always ranting against. You're not getting it. You're not called to antagonize people. You're called to influence people. And yeah, I know some people are very frustrating, right? You gotta win them, and how do we do that? By living an irresistibly joy-filled, faith-filled life, and some of you, you're here tonight, you don't have that, and that is why we're taking communion. You need to ingest the bread of life, and it's here for you, okay? And I, I just, I want you to take in the bread of life. I want you to drink the blood of the God of the, the one who God sent to us because it heals and it flows through our body and in doing so, you will discover everything you need for life and for godliness. And so can we just pray? Just bow your heads and pray. Second Peter 1, 3. Everything we need for life and for godliness comes through our knowledge of you, Lord. And we want to believe in you and we want to experience the faith that comes from following you. 
And God, I just know that you have so much power in your word. And, and it's going to get ever increasing as we expose ourselves to, to, to that power. But Lord, we want to just covenant with you. And we just want to even acknowledge, God, we're powerless to even get the desires that we need to serve you. And so I pray, even as we take communion tonight, that you would increase in us the desires to love you, to serve you, and to even just sense you and reveal you to the world. Lord, give us your thoughts starting tonight. Fill us even when it makes us feel uncomfortable. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. If you agree with that prayer, say amen. Right now what we're gonna do is we're gonna have our campus pastors come on up and we're just gonna, we're gonna, they're gonna tell you how to take the elements. But I'm promising you, church, some of you, you're gonna get healed taking these elements because it's a supernatural thing that we're doing, okay? And so I don't know what it is you need in your life tonight, but I do know this, is that when you covenant with an all-sufficient God, it starts to flow into your life. So just receive it tonight, amen?